Ahmaduhu wa salli ala Rasul al Kareem. Today we're going to talk about a legend, a Muslim revolutionary, uh, the likes of which history has very few times produced. Uh, we're going to talk about the life and the works and some statements that Uthman Dan Foley has written a great African Muslim scholar. You, you're, when by the end, if you listen to this whole video and his whole life, you'll be, you'll be inspired, you'll be motivated, and you will learn so much about the deen from the larger perspective, the broad perspective of what Muslims need to do today. Okay? And to do this, to explain this, I used this brother, I, I don't know who he is, but he did an awesome job. May Allah bless him a billion times. I mean, may Allah bless him a billion times for doing this and the production, the group that did this video, because they talked about a scholar that uh, needs to be brought up in current times and to talk about how he stood up and how he fought against corrupt leaders and the process by which he did this. And this person is very special to me because his grand teacher is the same grand teacher that we had in the Indian subcontinent, Shawliullah Muhaddas Dilbi Rahmatullah. One day I want to do a video just on him. Shawliullah Muhaddas Dilbi Rahmatullah. What to speak of him? He is the first person to translate Quran into a different language. Imagine the fatah was against him at that time. And look today. He was the person who, in what, what the West had accomplished in 500 years of, uh, what the West had accomplished in 500 years of, its renaissance, Shawlullah Muhaddas Dilbi Rahmatullah did that in his own personality. He, all the asanid of hadith ijazas come through Shawlullah Muhaddas Dilbi Rahmatullah And uh, <clears throat> so, therefore, of course, my link, personal link with Shawlullah Muhaddas Dilbi Rahmatullah whose grand student started Darul Aloom also, uh, is... Uh, I feel a personal, spiritual, strong attachment to him uh, because of his relevance for what he did then to even today. And one of his students, Uthman Dan Foley, one of his students, one of the manifestations of Shawliullah's hard works, one of the seeds he put into the ground, one of his students, he is this legend from Africa. And let this be a lesson to Muslims in Africa that you have potential to do work in the end times. Let you let all Muslims in Africa follow the way of Uthman Danfolio, as you will see. Do what he did, the way he did it, because he followed the Sunnah, as will become evidently clear. He's amongst those scholars who died at the age of 63. He's amongst those great ones who died at the age near the age when the Prophet ﷺ passed away because of his extreme love for the Prophet ﷺ. And so, these were extraordinary people, really extraordinary people. And these are not people from a thousand years ago. No, just 200 years, 300 years ago. These were people that were coming into the age that we live in. They were coming into the, you know, the 17th, 18th century. And so, Shawlullah Muhaddas Alayhi saw this. And he prepared these people uh, accordingly uh, to the, you know, to the best of his ability. And so now, with this, uh, let us start with this brother's commentary on this great legend who brought Khilafa, the Sekoto Khilafa, fought against Muslim leaders, went through turbulent times, almost, uh, you can say, uh, uh, against extreme odds, you know, against him. Uh, David and Goliath type situation, but his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and so what are the lessons here? Number one, that no, because I know racism still exists in the Muslim world. And we don't choose, Allah chooses who is, he's going to use for his deen. Allah could use me inshallah for his deen. Allah can use another brother. Whatever Allah wants, that's what we want, right? And Muslims in Africa, Muslims in Africa have a great potential. They may be the secret weapon to Islam. They may be the secret weapon to Islam. You know, because the Arab world's tied up. We know the Arab world's tied up. The Asian world is in a um, upheaval, uh, kind of like an earthquake. Okay. And 
the only Muslims uh, that are kind of like they're also exploited. Muslims in Africa, Africa itself is exploited, but there's also a, a lot of potential that's there that is not in other places. Having said this, the other thing I wanted to mention was the lesson to hear, and we are going to study the words of this great scholar, uh, Sheikh Uthman Danfolio. Many of the West African slaves that came to America were students, grand grand students of uh, of Uthman Danfolio. Okay, and <clears throat> so with that said, let's now start studying about this great scholar. Muslim hero, what comes to your mind? Do you think Salah al-Din, <coughs> Mehmed Fatih, or how about the Mamluk Sultan Saifuddin Qutuz? All of them military leaders, all of them wielded unimaginable strength. But what if I told you that there existed another Muslim hero whose story was so miraculous that it seems like something out of a novel? Chances are you probably never heard of him. From humble beginnings as a student of knowledge to the rise of being the founder of a new movement that would transform and revive Islam right here in the belly of Africa. This trans By the way, this is also important people that are thinking about hijra and doing hijra and this would give you a vision of what the future could look like. This formative movement would shake the hearts of the people in West Africa and would change its social, political and religious character forever. Under its shade, it produced scholars, Qur'an memorizers, and morally righteous people from both men and women. He was a scholar in his own right and wrote hundreds of works. And for the sisters, Uthman Danfolio's daughter Asma, who was a great poetess, she, she wrote poetry. And Uthman Danfolio was very open to women, as you'll see, uh, in learning the deen. Okay, and, and, and this was, uh, as you'll see, now just watch. Islamic sciences, he even penned this book, which is a little manual on how to establish Islam, Iman, and Ihsan in our lives, which is really cool. For decades, he clashed with an oppressive class of rulers and just so happened to establish a new caliphate state along the way. That's right, you heard that correctly. He established a new caliphate right in the middle of Africa. He was perhaps one of the most influential West African scholars in Islamic history. Some scholars said he was the Mujaddid of his time, while there were others who said that he was nothing but a destructive nuisance. So was he a Mujaddid? And more importantly, who was he? Let's find out. Uthman Dan Thodio, the Sheikh that would change Hosaland forever. But before we can talk about who Uthman is and what he's done, we've got to talk about what Hosalam is and what it used to be before the Shehu arrived on the scene. Shehu meaning Sheikh in the Hossa language. So let's rewind the tape of time and go back even further than 1754, which is Dan Fodia's birthday. Hosalam was the center of Bilad Sudan which is a vast region of the savannah grassland. It's like a melting pot of different ethnic groups, including the Hossas and Fulanis. Prior to Islam, Hossalan was dominated by pagan beliefs. It wasn't until the 14th century when Islam made its way in. With the spread of literacy, the constant flow of Islamic literature, Hossalan became increasingly incorporated into the wider Islamic fraternity. Its people became well informed about Islamic thoughts and later on Islam emerged as a political force which changed political leadership in some major Hossa states. In the 16th century, an invasion of neighboring power and the seizure of Timbuktu weakened the intellectual impetus and upset the established political stability of Hossaland. Timbuktu was like uh, a type of Darul Ulum where people went to learn the deen. Okay? For, you know, in terms of racism, I want to tell you that there were people that felt honored picking up the shoes of the ulama of Timbuktu. They would go from different, they would go from Singapore, they would go from Malaysia, Indonesia, from Indian subcontinent, from Syria even, and they would consider it their honor to pick up the shoes of these scholars in Africa. And this, this uh, history needs to be revived because we're cut off from our own history, both contemporary as well as past. And so let's now continue inshallah. 
This was because this neighboring power kept Hossa states in check. The following two centuries that followed saw powerful Hossa states engage in continuous devastating interstate warfare. As warfare entrenched itself in the lands, rulers became desperate for victory, which often meant the violation of boundaries set by Islam. Political leadership in Hossa land degenerated into tyranny and corruption, which resulted in widespread oppression, injustice, and misery for most people. Paganism resurfaced its ugly head, and some Muslims mixed Islam. So now, remember this. Back then, paganism resurfaced. Now you got paganism resurfacing in the Arab world again with the Hindu temple and all. Okay, and yoga is becoming an art uh, to do in Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you know about this. But you know, these these kind of like uh, dis, uh, practices and customs of the others influencing the Muslim world. So this is what was happening at that time. This is exactly what's happening today. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So you have, for example, Saudi Arabia's first yoga festival offers mindfulness and embraces, Saudi Arabia embraces India's yoga, okay, and uh, yoga to be introduced in Saudi schools as a support, okay, they didn't even do that in America, dude, I mean, seriously, yoga flourishing amid Saudi Arabia reform drive, Saudi Arabia introduces yoga in universities, you know how the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi paganism would come back to Arabia? Well, listen to this report, okay? According to this report, Hinduism has become the fastest growing religion in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. This report suggests that nearly one million Hindus are expected to move to a different region over the next four decades. In Saudi Arabia, the Hindus currently make 1% of the, 1 .1 of the population. Hinduism, the fastest growing religion in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, okay? And so, uh, why is this happening? Because, you know, they're building Hindu temples and paving the way for Hinduism uh, in, let's say, type in Middle East here for a second, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, the Hindu temple is what I should say. You all know about this already, right? Uh, a Hindu mandir. Okay, the mandir is the Hindu temple in Abu, Duba, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Okay, so now you have, you know, uh, uh, is the traditional Hindu place of worship that is being built by in, 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 in Dubai. They're building this, okay. Our mandirs, uh, Hindu temples in the Middle Eastern, okay. So this gives you an idea of what I'm trying to say. Okay, now let's go back. So history is repeating itself just in a different way. Islamic practices with traditional pagan rituals. The result was disbelief, inequity, and open defiance of Allah's laws had become the order of the day. The social system was immoral and women were oppressed. As a Shehu said, they were neglected like animals. Mixing was very open and rampant. Cheating and fraud was rife as certain Sharia laws concerning property were geared to the Hossa ruling class. Muslim scholars were silent in the face of such tyranny and injustice. Some even supported it and others objected to it. One of the few who objected earlier on was Sheikh Jibril ibn Umar, none other than Uthman's teacher. So, Shaulullah Muhaddis Delvi rahmatullah alayhi, he taught a Zabidi. A Zabidi taught a Sindhi. A Sindhi taught Umar Jibreel, who taught Uthman Danfolio. Okay? So, Umar Jibreel is also in this chain that goes back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa via Shaulullah Muhaddis Delvi rahmatullah alayhi. So, so, Umar Jibreel rahmatullah alayhi taught Uthman he was highly enthusiastic about the revivification and restoration of Islam, so much so that he in fact organized a jihad. Sheikh Jibril and others who came before him embodied the idea of tajdid. We're going to talk about the jihad of Shaulullah and his grandchildren, the jihad that they did in the Indian subcontinent, but right now we're going to focus on this. Which is ingrained in the tradition of Islamic thought. Tajdeed is a philosophy of renewal and reinvigoration of a society from its dark heedlessness to a righteous rising. For so there are two words used in Islamic literature. One is Islah. Islah means to make something right. Islah can be done as long as, of course, uh, the, the fitna is not so much. Let's say the fitna is less than 50%. So you work on Islah, make Islah. Okay? Tajdeed is 
you have to start from scratch. Like the fitna is most so much that the it the whole system needs to be removed and something new needs to be put in its place. When the fitna grows so much, you need tajweed, tajdeed. Okay, and that's what a mujaddid does. That's why they called Uthman Dan Folio, including Shaulullah Muhaddas Delvi. Shaulullah was definitely the mujaddid of the 12th century. There's no question about this. Just like Omar bin Abdul Aziz was the mujaddid of the first century, and it continues like this. So definitely, there's almost 100% agreement. Uh, Shaulullah is the mujaddid of the 12th century. Okay, so you can say uh, Imam Ghazali plus Ibn Taymiyyah. The good aspects of Ibn Taymiyyah. Imam Ghazali plus Ibn Taymiyyah equal Shaulullah Muhaddas Delvi Rahmatullah Ali. Okay, so now let's continue on this. For example, the prophethood as a concept is intertwined with the idea of Tajdeed. It was out of this rising tide of discontent on one hand and expectation on the other that Osman Dan Fodio emerged. So, now that we covered the background of which Shehu Osman came from, we can now look at how he came to change them. The Shehu was born into a highly cultured family and was fed religious Islamic knowledge until he couldn't fit it within his mental capacity. His father was Muhammad ibn Saleh, known generally as Fodio, or the learned, and his mother was Hawa bint Muhammad ibn Uthman. His first teachers were his parents as he learned the Quran under his father's hand and most of his education was from his family and close relatives. Afterwards, he studied hadith in which he received qualifications. And this is where, uh, he doesn't mention this, but Shaulullah Muhaddas Delvi was the main teacher of his hadith studies, where he studied the Sasitta, the six books, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmizi, Ibn Majah, Nisai, as well as the Muwatta of Imam Malik, under Shaulullah Muhaddas Delvi And this is where he spent a big chunk of his time of his life in getting, uh, getting, uh, um, his studies of hadith from there. Uh, okay, let's continue. In the six most canonical books of hadith, including al muwatta by Imam Malik. He then mastered Arabic, grammar, morphology, and rhetoric, plus getting qualification in tafsir of the Qur'an, and became a jurist in the Maliki Madhab. From a young age, he would perfect basic sciences until he was given... He, stu he studied Asul al-Tafsir fi Fawz al the Fawzul Kabir fi Asul al Tafsir, I think that's the name of the book of Shaulila, is his principles of Tafsir, which are very phenomenal, by the way. Uh, so, just letting you know what I know of what he studied. Uh, a license or ijaza to teach. But when he would teach, he would never stop learning. This cycle would continue right up until his death. Of all the lessons he learned, of all the ideas he consumed, none would plant themselves deeply as much as the idea of Tajdeed passed down to him by his sheikh Jibril ibn Umar. As mentioned and explained previously, part of the process of Tajdeed... When I will talk about Shaulila, I'll make this clear. It was Shaulila Muhaddas Delbi Rahmatullah who started the slogan. The slogan, what? Fakku kullu nazam, fakku kullu, fakku, fakku rakaba, as it comes in Quran. Let go, uh, untie the necks of the slaves, right? So, fakku kullu nazam, untie all systems. Whether at that time communism didn't exist, I'm giving as an example. Let untie, untie, and throw away, unshackle all systems. That was his slogan. Uh, and so it was from there that Shaulullah taught Zabidi and then Asindi and then Umar Jibra'il. And they, in our tradition of Islam with Shaulullah Muhaddas Delmi Rahmatullah this idea of tajdeed of deen, fakku uh, kullu nizam, destroy all systems is part and parcel of, of traditional Islam, especially that traditional Islam that comes through the lineage of Shaulullah Muhaddas Delmi Rahmatullah Ali. So now, it involves Shaulullah understood that now we're entering an age where systems that will put people under ideologies and systems where they, unless they try to free themselves from it, they won't be really uh, you can say guided uh, to to the to to the path of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not if they would be Muslim or not. The issue is not takfir. The issue is to how do you bring about the rebringing back of the khilafa. And so fakku kullu nizam, just uh, unchain yourself from all systems. 
to replace it with the system of Islam. And this is what Shaulullah Muhaddas Dilbi in one of his most uh, important books of purification of the souls, Nufusul Arifin, uh, in the last chapters, you know, he talks about that one of the things that needs to be done for purification of the soul is the work for Iqamatul Din. Meaning, you, and this will become more clear as we talk about uh, Uthman Dan Fulni Rahmatullah's life, but the establishment of deen as a system, as a way of life. Okay. Mujaddid taking a group of people and sculpting their character to that of the prophetic model. These people then go out to call for the revival of Islam. They are the shapers and shakers who will shoulder the responsibility of running the new social order when it is established. Othman Dan Fodio, as a Mujaddid created people who are reflections of his own image who in turn create others in the same fashion and so on. He couldn't rely on the scholars that had rooted themselves in the corrupt infertile land. Instead, he created his own community of scholars and teachers. These students of his formed the inner core of a movement and spearheaded the prosecution of the true jihad and carried it to its successful end. This movement was and this is for those people that say, oh, don't speak against leaders. This is what happens. If your da'wah is true, this is what happens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, tawasso bil haq, tawasso bil sabr. Enjoin one another to truth and enjoin one another patience. Because why? When you enjoin one another to truth, the inevitable result will be there's going to be a reaction and you're going to have to have sabr. You invite people to Islam, society is going to react. If you're inviting on the truth and if there's no reaction to your da'wah, then you're probably not on the prophetic model. Because the prophetic model teaches us that your da'wah has to create a reaction within that society that works both against you as well as for you. It works for you because it, it creates the conversation, the advertisement, so on and so forth, the marketing for your cause. But it's difficult in terms of your ego and your character and your disrespect and putting people, putting you through hard times. But if you have trust in Allah, then you will come out of that, inshallah, and emerge from that uh, with better results. It's known as the Jama'ah. One thing to note about the Shehu. Now, those of you that have been listening to me for a long time, you know what I talk about. Fatua, rebringing back manhood. And with this on the side, re feminism. Uh, not uh, not uh, feminism versus what? Uh, feminists. Okay? bringing back feminism and bringing back fatua islamic chivalry back and number two and and with that is the purification of the soul number two is having a jama'ah okay that shawlila muhaddas dilmi rahmatullahi understood and of course then uthman dan polnu rahmatullahi also understood that we live in times that in order to be successful for islam and in order to protect your iman you must be with people around you in the form of a jama'ah okay and so you have fatwa, you have jama'ah, then you have hijra, okay, and then you have, if necessary, jihad, okay. And so, uh, inshallah, we'll come to uh, these issues, but let's listen to this. His teachings is that he never invented a new form of teaching. He never preached a new lesson, nor did he reinvent the wheel. He taught from the same books that were taught for the past 1,000 years or so and took lessons from his teachers who had chains of transmissions all the way back to the Prophet. If that's the case, then what made the Shehu so different and so effective? Well, the answer can be found in his writings, whereby he mentions that scholars lack the knowledge of the exact nature and the implications of current nepotism, moral transgression, and political tyranny. So it's not knowing the books of the past. Many people know the books of the past. They're not able to understand the relevance of the times that they they are in, the the fitness of this time, the fitness of the times that you live in, and how that relates to those books, right? So that is where things are lacking. Rather than knowledge, Islam was missing from Hassa scholarship. In other words, knowledge of Islam should not only be studied but it should be practiced as well. 
from the moment that Thodio started preaching in 1774, at age 20, he met much opposition for his orthodox views as some scholars felt envious of the young sheikh's growing pupils. He based himself in Begal and traveled to regions around its radius. At this early stage, Othman avoided authorities altogether and warned his students of becoming cozy with rulers as he himself was not in the habit of going to kings nor had he anything to do with them. But years later, when his movement became too big to stay under a rock, his affair became well known to the kings and so found it politically correct to approach them. In 1780, he went to the king of Goba, Bawa, and preached to him the true message of Islam and advised him to establish justice in his lands. Although advice fell on deaf ears, Othman walked away from the... So this is going to the kings, going to the leaders and telling them to establish justice. That telling them to establish justice is a form of opposition. Number one. Number two. He didn't just say this, he also wrote about this. Encounter as a sheikh to be taken seriously, and so even those who did not fear God were afraid to reject Othman's preaching because of his contact with the ruler. Whether it was deliberate or not, this was one of the first genius moves the sheikh who made that gave way to a successful transformation. So Othman kept on traveling, preaching, teaching, gaining traction, and successfully accumulating students from places where people are known to be completely ignorant, like Zemfarawa. His assemblies were filled with crowds of men and... He especially, not only was he teaching Muslims, but he was bringing multitudes of people into Islam. So he was doing both works. He was creating students that non-Muslims would look at, and they would be like, wow, we want to be like these people. And women which often got him into the crosshairs of other scholars. He was attacked for apparently preaching to mixed crowds and that women shouldn't be going out of their homes, even for religious knowledge, to attend his classes. First of all, Shehu Othman seated men and women separately. Secondly, he questioned, if women are obliged to go out to perform Hajj, then why is she then not allowed to go out and learn about her faith? As a matter of fact, he regarded those scholars who opposed this as hypocrites who left their wives, daughters, and sisters ignorant at home while he goes and gives knowledge to other people. In 1788, the Shehu had made considerable progress in establishing himself as a moral and social focus in Hossa land and in endearing himself to a large cross-section of Hossa communities. He was invited for a second time to Goba to visit the Sultan again, only this time to offer aid prayers. When Othman and his followers responded to the invitation, Bawa had seen this progress and saw the Shehu as a community leader as well as a respected voice this time. Perhaps in an effort to buy the loyalty of the Shehu, the king offered wealth in alms like gold. Othman stood up before the king and said he and his community are in no need of his wealth. Instead, he requested a couple of things. Number one, that the Shehu himself be allowed a free hand to call people to Allah. Two. No hindrance be placed before people who wish to respond to the call. 3. Members of the Jama'a who were identified with their turbans, for men, and their head covers, for women, are to be respected. 4. That all prisoners are to be freed. Number 5. People should not be burdened by heavy unjust taxes. That by the way, this was a com one of the main, uh, you can say, pivots. His jihad against high taxes. Okay, that people were treated as animals and were overly taxed by the kings. Uh, this was a major part of his, you can say, jihad against these corrupt Muslim rulers. Bawa, seeing the writing on the wall as he stood in front of the Shehu and his many followers, accepted and granted the requests. Another successful outcome after another visit to the ruler. By the time he had reached the age of 40 in 1794, Othman Dan Ferdio had become the quintessential voice, teacher, scholar, preacher, and leader in all of West Africa. With this reputation and fame, tension grew between the Shehu's Jama'a and the aristocratic Hossa rulers. Some scholars grew jealous of his movement as they were quick to criticize and scrutinize every move the Shehu made. It was at this time when there was no mention of the Shehu traveling to... So if you have a movement that has millions and millions and millions of dollars behind its back, but yet the aristocratic have no problem with that movement, then there's a problem with that movement because this is not in line with the uh, prophetic movement within any land. 
preach anymore. He receded back to Degal, which was the center of learning for people to come and receive knowledge and guidance. As a reformer, education was his greatest tool. He educated the common people, Islamic doctrine, and separated advanced pupils in different classes. His advanced pupils would stick to him and learn from his guidance throughout their lives. He wanted his... Now, one very important point here, which is something that Shaulullah Muhaddas Dil bin did, and then after that, Shaykh al-Islam Mahmud al-Hassan also emphasized upon, which is that he taught the average person their responsibility in Islam. How do you do Hajj? How do you do Salah? What is Amr bil Maruf? What is Nahyan bin Munkar? What is enjoining good? What is forbidding evil? And what are the basics of the deen that everyone should know? That was also important just as to create scholars was important. So teaching the Muslims the basics of their deen and teaching the Muslims that we need to do tajdeed and we need to re-establish khilafah and we need to establish justice in our lands. This is something every Muslim should know. This is something every Muslim should Every teacher should be teaching the awam. And so he was speaking out against, for example, like I mentioned, the taxes. Pupils to teach in different areas, but was adamant on opposing letting unqualified teachers teach. The Shehu was a prolific writer, writing books contemporarily for his people according to their understanding, as he regarded contemporary writings are of much greater value because every learned man knows about the people of his particular time. The Sheikh's intention was to establish Sharia and implement it to its fullest extent. This naturally meant that his reformatory movement butt heads with the politics of the time. The Jama'a grew bigger, more people came to settle in Begal, even some soldiers joined the Jama'a. Meanwhile, the King Bawa had passed on and his son, Nafata, inherited his throne and his problems with the Jama'a in 1790. Where Bawa was covertly opposing Uthman, Nefeta openly sought to destroy the Shehu and his Jama'a. The Jama'a threats had become too big to ignore. Uthman had broken off from the degenerate order, his movement had its own leadership and a distinct social and moral identity. The rulers for the first time were brought to the situation where their pockets are not full and their efforts unprofitable. They knew that the rise of a new Islamic order meant that all they had sought to attain through opportunistic exploitation and oppressive laws would be swept away. The Hossa rulers were fully aware of these consequences and sought to end the growing threats. So when they found out the Shehu was urging his followers to arm themselves in 1795, this straw didn't just break the camel's back, it broke the whole caravan. Finally, after 20 years of growth right under the nose of the oppressive rulers, Nefeta issued his infamous decree. No one except the Shehu can preach to the people. No one should become a Muslim except those who inherited it from their parents, those who embraced Islam. That's because a lot of the people that had, uh, that had, were part of the Jama'ah that Uthman Dan fully established were of reverts, of people that came to Islam should return to their religion of their forefathers, i.e. paganism. No man should henceforth wear the turban, nor woman the head covering. Shortly after this, Nefeta died and was succeeded by his son, Yunfa, in 1803. Yunfa had invited Shehu Uthman to his palace and sought to end his greatest threat. Upon entering the palace with his brother Abdullahi, the Sultan fired his gun at the Shehu in an attempt to kill him. By some miracle, the gun misfired and almost burnt Yunfa in the process. Uthman Dan Furio had survived the attempt. Yunfa made his enmity clear to Uthman. The Shehu bravely informed Yunfa that he does not fear him nor anyone except Allah. Dan Furio walked away unharmed and didn't mention this to a single soul. This was the last... Now, what I want to mention here is miracles do happen when you're sincere in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And miracles should be expected to happen, not the way you want it, not when you want it, not how you want it, but just as if you're walking in the desert and the sand throws itself up because you put your feet on, you know, you're walking and you, the dust rises up from the stamp of your feet. It happens. It's, it's to be expected.
After all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests people and after testing them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers people with his gifts. And miracles, kirama, is one of those things. And this will happen, inshallah, in the last shower that is coming. In the last shower of the ummah, the Prophet told us about, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the example of my ummah is like a shower. And so just as there were many miracles in the beginning of the ummah, there will be many miracles towards the end of the ummah. Last contact Uthman had with any ruler in Goba. The Shehu was a master strategist in using every situation to his advantage. But it is interesting to note that Uthman didn't seek to capitalize on this particular situation. He kept quiet because he wanted to safeguard the Jama'ah's well-being and survival. He knew that just because the Jama'ah had a numerical advantage, it doesn't necessarily mean overall success. For 20 years, he had interacted with regimes and sought to provoke him into direct armed confrontation. Dan Furio exercised restraint and refused to take any premature steps. He was patient and it paid off well. See, the Sheikh who believed that once an armed confrontation is started, it must be carried out to its logical conclusion and that if the movement isn't capable of sustaining armed struggle, it should not rush into it unless it merely wants weak and oppressed Muslims to be annihilated. He believed So this is a very important rule that comes from the Hanafi fiqh as well as the Maliki fiqh. As you know, Sheikh Uthman Danfolio was a Maliki, a traditionalist. <coughs> And that is that jihad should only begin when, when the shura of the jama'ah agrees that we have enough power to take on the oppressors. But if you do not have enough power to deal with the fitna, whether it is in form of armed conflict or it is the fitnas of that society, if you don't have the power to deal with the fitna, what should you do? You should do what Uthman Danfolio did, which you will see now that time was on his side and that if anybody had feared that time would run out, it was the oppressors themselves, not him. After the threat on the Shehu's life, events followed one after another in rapid succession. This didn't mean throwing off the tyrants because the Jama'ah couldn't muster enough coordinated strength at this point. Hijra was now on the table and according to the Shehu, obligatory if the Jama'ah was to survive its spiritual journey. Now, I don't know about you, but this is starting to sound like something similar to the Prophet's. The spiritual journey of the individual and the spiritual journey of the Jama'ah. If you are on truth, your spiritual journey on the Jama'ah will begin to look like the Seerah of the Prophet wasallam, in different shapes and manifestations. Good story. Maybe you should bookmark that. Anyway, some scholars and reciters of the Qur'an who fled to Gimbana needed strength at this point. Hijra was now on the table and according to the Shehu, obligatory if the Jama'ah was to survive its spiritual journey. Now, I don't know about you, but this is starting to sound like something similar to the Prophet's story. Maybe you should bookmark that. Anyway, some scholars and reciters of the Qur'an who fled to Gimbana were murdered by Yunfa's soldiers and their women and children were taken as slaves and sold. To add to the trauma, Yunfa's men were boastfully paraphrasing the Qur'an. So when the Jama'ah is on a spiritual path, it will be tested, just like the individuals in the Jama'ah are being tested. So the test is at the collective level and the test is at the individual level, both. And sometimes you have problems at home with your kids or with whatever, and you also have the problems of the Jama'ah. That's just how it is. Bring down upon us the divine punishment. The only thing that matters is the wor is the rida of Allah, is the happiness of Allah. And the only thing that matters is if you're on that same path that the path of the Prophet was on. You had promised it, if indeed you were truthful. This was all done in the month of Ramadan. In 1804, the Shehu and his followers left Begal and made Hijra to Gudu. The scale of people fleeing alarmed the rulers of Goba, so much so that efforts were made to stop the mass movements by intimidation, plunder, and slaughter. When this was proven unsuccessful, 
Yunfa wrote to Uthman to ask him to come back. A back and forth of letters between the Shehu and Yunfa took place, which brought about no change. This was due to some corrupt scholars disrupting communications by distorting Uthman's letters to be more unreasonable in their conditions for return. The Sultan ordered his governors to take all who traveled to the Shehu as captives. This was followed by persecution of Muslims, killings, and confiscation of property. This, as you would expect, was suffocating the Muslims and left them with no choice but to take up arms and defend themselves. The only option left on the table was jihad. So the flag of Islam was hoisted for the first... So Fatua, Jama'a, Hijra, and Jihad. This time in that region, the Sultan would ask for support from different rulers across Bilad Sudan, and that they did. So now, the Jama'a had to contend with other opposing regional rulers, as well as Yunfa and his army. He appointed his brother and esteemed scholar Abdullahi as its commander. The Jama'a wasn't as organized and well equipped as the Goba forces as they were made up of people who were poor and driven away from their homes and properties. But they all had one thing in common, that is their beliefs and being inspired by their love for Allah and his religion. The two armies met at Gudam on a lake known as Tapkim Kuato in 1804. By some miracle, the Muslims emerged victorious. Abdullahi said this victory was their battle of Badr. This greatly boosted the morale of the Muslim forces and enhanced the prestige of the Shehu and increased his influence. But this was in no way a complete victory with a bow on top. Several years of hardship laid ahead, and oh how hard they were. They were surrounded by enemies, persistent hunger and starvation, as well as raging war remained an obstacle in the face of their survival. So if the battle of Tapkin Kuato was their battle, then the battle of Tuantua was their battle of Uhud. Abdullahi was injured and nursing a wound from battle, and Muhammad Bello, Osman's son, was sick. Bello advised that the Jama'a not go out and meet the enemy. Instead, they should stay close to the camp and remain defensive. The advice was rejected and the two armies met. The result was a crushing defeat to the Muslims. In all, more than 2,000 men were killed, including 200 men who had memorized the Qur'an by heart. A large portion of morally upright and old students of the Shehu were martyred. It was witnessed that Uthman had never been angrier than they have ever seen him before or after that event. Although many moral religious men and women remained, one band of undisciplined and irresponsible Muslims from the Jama'a attacked people who were at peace with the Muslims. Abdullahi and Bello failed to stop the attack and nearly died when they tried to prevent them. Abdullahi in particular was greatly disturbed and wished to discontinue the march, being certain that Muslims with such undisciplined bands would face utter defeat. He also mentioned that the reason why these... This is the importance of the discipline of the Jama'a. Now notice the and you'll see this the ad, the advice that was given by the second in command Abdullahi Uthman Danfolio's brother and his son that we should not march out we should stay here and fight defensively Uthman Danfolio rejected after taking sure rejected their advice twice but they didn't break ranks from the Jama'ah because why he was the leader that you obey even if he is wrong he is the leader who you obey even if he did something wrong. Not those corrupt leaders. This is not what the Prophet means by the word Amir. Because Uthman Danfolio was an Amir who had taken Bayah. These corrupt secular rulers, they don't have no Bayah. Guided individuals found their way into the army is because of the loss of so many righteous men who would otherwise put people in check. The Shehu kept on writing to the rulers of Hossaland, exhorting them hearts. A large portion of morally upright and old students of the Shehu were martyred. It was witnessed that Uthman had never been angrier than they have ever seen him before or after that event. Although many moral religious men and women remained, 
one band of undisciplined and irresponsible Muslims from the Jama'a attacked people who were at peace with the Muslims. Abdullahi and Bello failed to stop the attack and nearly died when they tried to prevent them. Abdullahi in particular was greatly disturbed and wished to discontinue the march, being certain that Muslims with such undisciplined bands would face utter defeat. He also mentioned that the reason why these misguided individuals found their way into the army is because of the loss of so many righteous men who would otherwise put people in check. The Shehu kept on writing to the rulers of Hossaland, exhorting them to become true Muslims and support the cause of Islam. Sultans mostly refused in arrogance and rejected while others were killed accepting. Just when news couldn't have been worse, Somehow, it did. During the second year of Hijrah, Yunfa, along with the other fellow rulers, was getting another even greater force prepared against the Muslims. The Jama'a was divided on whether to go out to meet the enemy or be more defensive. Just like last time, Abdullahi and Bello thought it more strategic to take a more defensive measure, and just like last time, they were rejected in the council meeting. The result was... Not good. The Muslims were defeated and suffered another staggering loss of about 1,000 men. To say that this was a moment of crisis for the Shehu and the Jama'a would be an understatement. This defeat put the Jama'a's fate in jeopardy. The Shehu, in order to boost morale, came out of the mosque and gave a speech and began to preach with love and kindness. He exhorted them to forsake evil doing and turn to the path of righteousness. He prayed for their victory and his words made them eager to fight again. The fact is, those who were committed to the Jihad were firmly in charge and thousands of others were ready to lay down their lives in the cause of Allah. The result was that the Jama'a unleashed a feast. Try to think of the level of reliance on Allah a person needs at a moment like that. And that you come to your Jama'a that you raised and you tell them, that we're going to trust Allah. This counterattack on the enemy which retreated to Guandu. This retreat was decisive in the turning point in the struggle since Muslims never suffered defeat again at the hands of Hossa rulers. After several expeditions were undertaken, leaders from different parts of the region pledged allegiance to the Shehu and recognize him as a new Khalifa in Sokoto. In the fifth year of Hijra, the Shehu decided on a combined assault on Al Kalawa, the capital of Goba. His son Muhammad Bello was in command this time. Finally, after four years of fighting, Al Kalawa fell and marked the end of Hossa power and the beginning of a new epoch, that of the Khilafah. After the war, the establishment of the Khilafah meant that a new role emerged for the Shehu and his companions. Along with calling people to Islam, they now had to administer the state according to the Sharia stipulated in the Quran and the Sunnah. The Shehu was meticulous in stipulating principles and writing guidelines. Keep in mind that they were already implementing Sharia after Hijrah in their land that they had settled in. But now they had control, you can say they had full victory. And now they were going to replicate what they had done in, in their localized area into uh, the larger for which rulers and followers are to abide by if the Khilafah wish to grow morally, socially, economically, and etc. He touched on everything from prioritizing justice in society and politics, employing righteous and courageous scholars as advisors to rulers, utilization of... As you remember in the Hanafi fiqh I rem uh, from the tafsir we did yesterday, Jassas, what does he say? The condition for the Khalifa and the condition for the Qadi is justice. And the, 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 the constitution that Uthman Danfolio wrote was the same time that the American constitution was being written. And the American constitution mentions justice nowhere. But Uthman Danfolio's constitution mentioned justice in the beginning. of state resources and being conscientious of the hereafter. He was emphatic on reading the seerah and retaining the essence of it as the one point of guiding principle for rulers to follow. Shehu Uthman divided the responsibilities for the Khilafah between his two wazirs, Abdullahi 
who ran the western parts of the Khilafa, and Muhammad Bello, who administered the eastern parts. The Sheikh who remained Amir al muminin though he did not take direct part in the administration. He devoted most of his time to teaching and writing, counseling and guiding the Ummah. By the year 1812, the Sheikh who had fully given up his responsibilities to the two Wazirs. In 1815, he moved to Sokoto and in 1817, he died at the age of 63. His legacy is a He died at the Sunnah age, as many great scholars have always wanted that, and they did die at the Sunnah age. ...to say the least. Uthman Danfodio was the most important reforming leader of the Western Sudan region. He was a mujaddid and renewer of the faith who gave his life to the spread of Islam and teaching of its beliefs. His journey remarkably resembled that of the Prophet and his companions. He left behind him a network of students, a large corpus of writings in Arabic and Fulani, and covered most of the Islamic sciences which still enjoy circulation to this day. His importance lies in his activities as the founder of a Jama'ah or Islamic community, the Sokoto Caliphate, which brought the Hossa states and some neighboring territories under a single central administration for the first time in history. May Allah bless the Shehu and his companions and increase the number of people who follow his example. Ameen and may Allah increase for this brother for making this video and this YouTube channel that made this video. Okay, now let me... Now I would like to present to you in the end uh, something of the writings of Uthman Danfolio in his Kitab al-Amr bil Maruf wa Nahi anil Munkar. Okay? Ta'alif Shaykh Uthman Danfolio rahmatullah alayhi radiyallahu an. <coughs> he states, uh, he states in his book, uh, who can do Amr bil Maruf Nahi anil Munkar? Who can enjoin good and forbid the wrong? And this has to do with what? That the that there's those teachings that are for the ulama. And then there's that minimum teaching that needs to be taught to all human beings. And those minimum teachings that need to be taught to all Muslims. They don't have to be alim, but they have to know something of the deen, obviously. Right? So now, what does he say regarding the current issues that were happening at that time? He says... Meaning the enjoining good and forbidding the wrong is not specific to the people that are leaders in the Muslimina fi Sadr al Ula wa Ba'di Ya'muruna bil Ya'muruna Walata and Fusahum bil Maruf wa Yanhauna hum anil Munkar min Gaidi Nakir min Wahid. So he says even even the people in the past, they used to advise the government. They weren't part of the government. They used to tell the government what is good and what is bad without anyone uh, condemning them and without anyone saying you've done something, anything bad. And this is not something specific to the government. It's it's allowed for any one of these civilians and the subjects of the government to do Amr bil Maruf, Nayan al Munkar with their words and with their actions. But he says, but when it comes to certain things that can cause fitna, like uh, when it's time to do jihad, that should be done with the government. This is if the government's on the right. Okay. Walakin idhan intahal amru ila nasab al kital wa shataha al aslah. Then, when it comes to strife and uh, weapons, then that should be uh, you should stay away from fitna. Okay. Then, uh, then he says, "وَكَذَا ذَكَرَهُ إِمَامُ الْحَرَمِينَ رَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ تَعَالَى وَقَالَ إِنَّ الْحُكْمَ شَرْعِي إِذَا اسْتَوَى فِي إِدْرَاقِهِ الْعَالِمِ وَالْخَاصِ فَفِيهِ عَالِمٌ وَغَيْرِ عَالِمٍ." Amr bil Maruf in al Munkar. He says that Amr bil Maruf in al Munkar in the areas of Sharia are allowed for the person who is a scholar as well as not a scholar. Meaning, if you see your child not praying, you're going to tell him to pray, right? If you see your child doing something immodest, you're going to tell him, okay? If you see uh, there's an opportunity to give money to the poor, you're going to tell your child, give the money to the poor. You're going to enjoin the forbid the wrong. It has nothing to do with being a scholar, it is an obligation of every Muslim. Okay, and because why when some people 
uh, enjoined good for being wrong, people are, other people are saying, oh, but he's not a scholar. It doesn't matter if he's a scholar or not. Th that is a right of every Muslim to enjoin good for being wrong without uh, any conditions of who he's advising or not advising. Okay? Uh, ففيه عالم وغير عالم أمر بالمعروف ونهي عن المنكر وإذا تخص أدراكه بالاجتهاد فليس للأوام فيه أمر ولا نحي بل أمر موكل إلى أهل الاجتهاد. What is he saying? He's saying that there's some affairs that are in the middle. If you don't know about it or it's an affair of اجتهاد, then you leave that to the scholars. But those things that are common, and he continues to say, okay. وقال شبلي في شهر الأربعين النووي شبلي رحمة الله عليه in his أربعين his أربعين the forty hadiths in the shar of that the explanation of that he says إنما يعمر وينها من من كان عالما بما يعمر به وينها أنه okay whatever you know of good and evil you do it of the things that are well known okay فإن كان من أمور ظاهرة مثل الصلاة as far as the the Sharia is concerned, if it's something about salah or som or zina or shab shab al khamr, drinking alcohol, wanahuha, and things like that, فكل مسلم علم علماء بها. All the Muslims know about this. وإن كان من دقائق الأفعال والأقوال فما يتعلق بالاجتهاد لم يكن أوام فيه مدخل. So if it's uh, uh, things that the uh, the awam don't know or shouldn't know, then that, leave that to the ulama. Okay, but now, why am I saying this? I'm saying that any Muslim who understands something to be bad, like the Great Reset, or any Muslim who understands that liberalism is going to bring uh, uh, fuhush and fahash and indecency and immorality into the Muslim lands, every Muslim has a right to speak about those things, period. There's no question about this. Who said this? The greatest mujaddid of West Africa said this. Who is the student of the greatest mujaddid of the century, the 12th century Shawliullah Muhaddas Dilmi Rahmatullahi? Who had the similar opinions, by the way? You know, the Amr bin Maruf is wajib. Amr bin Maruf, Nahid al Munkar, is a farida upon the Muslims. And Amr bin Maruf is for the things that are fard, enjoining people to the good, meaning the fard. And Nahi an al Munkar, regarding the things that are haram, keeping people away from them. So, with that in mind, I hope you were able to appreciate the life of this mujaddid, the life of this great scholar, this legend of West Africa. And I hope it gives you appreciation to some of you for West Africa. It gives you appreciation for what Islam accomplished even in contemporary times. And it gives you an appreciation for the teachings of Islam and uh, even appreciating something small that our constitution in modern times by the hands of Uthman Dan Foldu had the words of justice, something that even the American constitution doesn't have. Even though it's considered one of the greatest constitutions uh, of history, but very few people have studied the constitution that was written by, uh, the dastur that was written by Uthman Dan Foldu. So, uh, anyway, we will... Uh, Pause here for today. Akulu qawli hadha. Astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'al muslimin wa li muslimat. Assalamu alaikum wa